So we're going to share this morning um, a word that I just experienced. I believe God wants to do something inside of us uh, to build some characteristics inside of us that can reposition us or position us in a way for the future so that when we encounter certain difficulties, certain tensions, certain challenges um, in life, that we are positioned in a way that those experiences will actually lift us uh, to the next level. And so I want to share with you um, a story out of my own life. Uh, just before the winter, um, I and my son Joshua, our middle son, went for, um, for canoeing on, on a river close to Bloemfontein. And, um, you know, previously I, I went for canoeing with a friend of mine, or kayaking rather, with a friend of mine on the, on the dam, the Kruger's, um, what's the dam's name? Yeah, the Kruger's Drift Dam. Kruger's Drift Dam, and, and that was smooth sailing, you know, no tension, you know, we could just enjoy the scenery. And then he said, that friend of mine, you know, but just, you know, come, let's, let's try the river and invite your son. And I don't know what I was thinking, but, but you know, I should have thought it was a good rain season. Uh, the, the river, there must be a lot of water in the river, but I didn't put two and two together. And so I said, yeah, let's do it. And I took Joshua along, and my goodness, was that an adventure. Because you know a river with a lot of water in LCB has got rapids in. And I was not prepared for that. So the first rapid that we struck, you know, the, the kayak overturned, you know, the one flip-flop went this side and, you know, you know, we were just hanging onto branches and it was crazy. And, um, you know, eventually we recollected ourselves and got everything together. And, and now this, this uh, sort of funny negotiation thing is kicking in between myself and Joshua, you know, because I could pick up, you know, I, I'm in a certain sense feel that, you know, should we continue with this? Was this a good idea? But you can't really, you can't really not carry on. And, and so this, this uh, strange negotiation between my son and myself is kicking in. And eventually, you know, we pushed through and we, um, and we finished it and we conquered that river. You know, we had a lovely photo taken of it. And it was a great experience with, with my son. But that reminds me that um, of life. Because, you know, Oftentimes, we, we go through life and, and everything is so nice, you know, everything is working out fine, it's smooth sailing, it's mundane, you go to work, you come back, you know, you have dinner, you woke up the next morning, you have breakfast, you know, you have Easter and then Christmas and it's the one year after the other and it's like rowing on that river and you just enjoy the sunshine and, and, and nature and the birds. And then suddenly, there's a rapid. And you have to cling for dear life for what's, and it's just all over the place, and you don't know if you're going to make it. And isn't that how life sometimes is? And all of us sort of experienced that uh, during COVID, isn't it? You know, you know, up to 2019, beginning 2020, everything was all right. You know, there were some ups and downs, but... But then COVID hit, and, and the whole world, you know, hit a rapid. And, um, and what I just experienced, you know, and even some of the turmoil that we are experiencing currently in our country, um, you know, that, that triggered a lot of conversations. You know, um, when, when I'm in ca casual conversation with some colleagues or some friends, you know, I can sort of pick up, and the theme of those conversations generally is, a reflection back, you know, why did it happen, you know, and, and a lot of theories and, and speculations happening. And, and the next question is, but what's lying ahead, you know, and, and um, are we going to make it, you know, is it, is it wise to stay where we are and what should we do and to prepare ourselves better and, and so on. And almost sort of an undercurrent of fear uh, and anxiety kicking in, in, in many of those conversations. And during this time, I just felt that in many aspects, we are missing the point. Because no, we know what the, the ultimate end is going to be. I mean, it's, it's all here. I, uh, if you haven't read it, you should, all right? It, uh, 
the end is going to be good. We're going to make it and um, we're going to have a lovely, lovely time for the eternity with the King of Kings. It's going to end well for all of us. Relax, right? But I believe God wants us, the better way to spend our energy is not to try sort of secure or figure out what the future is going to be and then try to avoid that or duck it or something like that. I believe the better way to spend our energy and, and the more, uh, well, what I also see in the Bible is to build certain characteristics inside of us so that when you and I hit the rapids of life, when the turmoil strikes, when, when there's a shaking in the environment, whether it's in your personal life or globally or nationally, when there's a shaking and, and the metaphorical rapid kicks in, that you and I are positioned and we've got the characteristics that we can handle it and that we can come out stronger at the end. I believe that is God's plan for each one of you and for me. Amen? But it all depends on the characteristics and the nature of what is inside of you. Right. So I want to start off with the illustration. And I intentionally choose uh, the illustration to show you what different characteristics of certain items, how it responds to turmoil or mistreatment or rapids, all right, or a shaking in the environment. So... The first, uh, just give me a moment. What is this? No, more, more correctly, it's a plate out of my wife's cupboard. All right, so that's the more accurate description of this. And so, um, what do you think will happen with this plate if you mistreat it and mishandle it? It's going to break. It's uh, not rocket science, but for the sake of the illustration, is this a wise thing to do, LCB? I took it out of my wife's cupboard. Is it not a wise thing to do? All right. Well, I'm a man of faith, so... Uh... Right. So... <laughs> She's not here. <laughs> so... Um... Is my secret safe with you? Uh, You're going to tell her. You've got something on me now, no? If we build certain characteristics inside of us, and there's a shaking and there's a tension and there's a sort of mistreatment, some people break. That is what happened. But it depends on the nature of what's that made of, right? So... I always thought that the opposite of that is uh, resilience, all right? So, um, so if I get mistreated and life push me down, then I just bounce back, right? And, um, and I always thought that, you know, this is what God desires of me. I need to be like this ball. I need to build certain characteristics inside of me. So that when I am mistreated and I am shaken and put under pressure, I just bounce back. And I, am, I carry on where I was. And uh, there's an English word for this. This is called resilience. Resilience. But you know, something bothered me of this. I work with people. Uh, I, I work at the university. And, and they are really outstanding people. Not necessarily serving the Lord, but they also have got this. So my question is, you know, so what's the difference between me and somebody not serving the Lord, just focused and working on himself or herself and their attitude, and they also went through COVID and they bounced back and everything is carrying on, and they're also going through difficulties in life, and they go in, you know, they handle themselves and they bounce back and they just carry on. And they've got resilience, and I've got resilience, so what? What's the difference if I'm serving the Lord and they are not serving the Lord? And then I discovered there's something else in the Bible, which is called the opposite of, if this is fragile, right? Have you ever seen, if you, on, sometimes on a box, there's written 
fragile. What does that mean? Please don't mishandle. Because if you mishandle and mistreat it, this is going to happen. You're going to get in trouble with your wife. So the opposite of fragile is not resilience, because the world can also do that. The opposite of fragile is, please shake me. Please mistreat me. Please put me under pressure. Please give me the rapids of life. Because if there's a shaking in my life, what will happen? Hold the mic. I will become stronger. You got the biggest fright. You can have the Coke. Don't open it now. No? That is what I see in the Bible. Is that when there's a shaking in your life and in my life, we not just merely bounce back. We go higher. So the better example would have been if I could find a different kind of a ball made of, out of a different kind of material and I throw it down, it would shoot you know, as high as the ceiling. That would have been a better example, right? But the best example I could get was the Coke bottle. So the biblical perspective is that if you build the right kind of characteristics inside of you, there is substance inside of you so that when you go through a shaking, when you hit the rapids of life, that shaking, almost like that, that Coke bottle, causes you to go higher. Amen. Not bouncing back, go higher. So that is what the Bible says, is that 2 Corinthians 3, we will go from glory to glory. Amen. How many times have we spoken in the past in this congregation about the metaphor of the eagle. What does an eagle do? An eagle flies into the storm and the stronger the storm is, the stronger the wind is, the higher the eagle goes because he's got a certain characteristic and a substance inside of him so that the storm works for the eagle and which makes him anti-fragile, not resilient, anti-fragile, that he uses the tension in the environment and the difficulty and the shaking in the environment to lift him higher. And there are many examples in the Bible that speak to this. That's why I say this is, um, um, I, I use the term anti-fragile. Um, there are many examples in the Bible. If you think of Israel when they were in Egypt, right? What happened? Tension, pressure, slavery. And then the 10 plagues. And just before they went out, all the Egyptians, or many of the Egyptians, gave their gold and, and precious things to the, they sort of stripped Egypt of their wealth before they went out, and then they went through the Red Sea, and the whole army of the Egyptians got drowned, and so they were in a much better place after the shaking than before the time. Do you agree with me? We see the same theme and the same tendency in the life of Daniel, right? His friends muster up against him, conspire spire against him, want to throw him into the lion's den. There's a shaking in his life. And um, he goes into the lion's den. And what happens? He comes out without any scar on him. And his friends got exposed. They die in the lion's den. And Daniel gets a promotion. So at the end, after the shaking, he's in a much better and a much higher place than what he was before. Did you know that in the early church, um, there, was a, there was a slogan, so up to 300 years, 330 years after Christ, there was an intense persecution of the church. I don't know if you know that part of church history. Intense persecution of the church. And there was a slogan, a saying in the early church, and it goes like this, the blood of the church is the seed of the church. The blood of the church is the seed of the church, which simply means that the more they got persecuted, the stronger the church grew. Because they had that substance inside of them. They, had, they were anti-fragile. The more the shaking, the more the rapids, the more the pressure, the more the mistreatment, the higher they went. And that, I believe, is the kind of characteristics that you and I should focus on at this stage to build into our lives. I don't know what's lying ahead. I don't know if there's going to be another pandemic. 
may, may not. I'm not saying there is going to be a no. I'm just saying I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen in your life. It might be smooth sailing now. Next week it might be rough seas for you. You might eat the rapid. I don't know. Life can change very quickly. The trick is not to try to figure out what's lying ahead and try to avoid it. The trick is to build a substance inside of you so that when the pressures of light, life hits, when the rapids hit, when you go through turmoil and mistreatment and shaking, that you have, like a wise virgin, prepared yourself well so that you go, will go higher. God will use that situation to take you higher. There's a scripture in Isaiah 60 which illustrates this beautifully. And as, as we go into the end times, I believe this is going to be a reality more and more. Listen carefully, verse 1 to 3. It says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and His glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Did you know that in the Old Testament, there's a, there's a term called the day of the Lord. It, it's, it's a day when God visits, and that's where God deals with his enemies and delivers his people. It's throughout the Old Testament, and it runs right through until Revelations. It repeats itself, and the ultimate day of the Lord is the second coming of Jesus Christ. But do you know it's the same day, it's the same event, it's the same shaking, it's the same turmoil that deals with the enemies and that elevates God's people. Same events. It's where are you positioned and what's inside of you. So when God visits and there's a shaking around you and there's a shaking in our nation and there's a shaking in the nations, the question is not whether it will happen. It will happen. It's designed by God. The question is, have you prepared yourself well and built in certain characteristics so that the nature of the substance inside of you positions you in a way so that when the turmoil strikes, it lifts you to a higher level and it will deal with, de deal with God's enemy. The sad thing is that because we focus on the wrong things, we don't do that. And oftentimes, unfortunately, our lives as Christians end up like this. Let me tell you one thing. This is not God's heart for you. God don't want broken people. Jesus Christ was broken for all of us. There's no reason why you should end up like this. Shattered anymore. You need to be, uh, I, I'm struggling to find the right Eng English word. You need to be broken before God in humility, but God never wants to break you, shatter you like this. That's why Jesus hung on the cross. He paid the price so that you can receive the blessing. This is not God's heart for you. So I believe then the wise thing for you and me is to, Stop and then ask God, Lord, but what do we need to build into our lives so that we can be anti-fragile, so that we can be like that eagle? And so I want us to turn to, to Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And I want to highlight three sort of principles or three things that you and I can do to reposition us. And I want to say from, from the word go that these are just three of many, 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 Many other things that you can do to build the right kind of substance and characteristics in your life. To position you in a way that you will gain from turmoil and rapids and shaking and mistreatment. Um, but I just merely want to, to highlight and, and, and lift out to you three, only three principles that you can immediately, I believe, start to apply in your life and in my life. Is that fine? And I intentionally chose Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Uh, because, why? Why do you think I chose it, Franzel? Help him, Renske. 
<laughs> At the end of Matthew 7, it says that, well, Jesus says that anyone who listens to these words of mine and apply it, start to do it in their lives, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The winds came, the rain came down, the storms came, and uh, the house did not fall. Thank you so much. All right. So that is God's heart for you. That's God's future for you and me. But then we need to build wise. We'll need, we need to be wise builders. Amen. Right. So that's why I chose Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Um, also to illustrate to you that God never said that, that uh, the rains will not come, the winds will not blow, and the storms will not be there. He never said that. So if you grew up with a theology or you hold fast to a theology to say that once you gave your, your life to Christ, all your troubles are over. Well, I've got news for you. That's not what the Bible says. You will go through turmoil and there will be rapids in your life. But God promised, number one, that he will be there. And number two, that he gave you his word so that you can build in certain characteristics in your life. So that those experiences can actually make you stronger. You with me? Right, so I'm going to read to you the three principles. We're going to work out of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And so for those of you who are taking notes, you can quickly jot it down, and then we will um, go into more detail with each one of them. So the first one is hidden recognition is equal to unlimited reward. It might not make sense to you now, but we will... Do a deep dive into each one of them. I'm going to read it again. Hidden recognition equals unlimited reward. You got that? Number two is limitation or limitations is equal to life. Limitation or limitations is equal to life. That's number two. And then number three is protect your freedom of choice to give. Protect your freedom of choice to give. All right. So are you ready for the first one? So... Um, So hidden recognition equals unlimited reward. So I want you to turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 1. It says, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by them by men i tell you the truth they have received their reward in full but when you give to the needy do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you and when you pray do not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. And I emphasize those words because they are important to remember. To be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And then we skip a few verses. We carry on verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. For they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. So that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So there's a rule, there's a principle, actually two principles, that is illustrated in this, this uh, portion of Scripture. The one rule will uh, make you fragile. 
The one rule will build kind of substance in your life that will, that will um, put you in a position where you will break when you are under pressure, when there's a shaking, when there's a mistreatment in the environment. That's the one rule. The other rule is if you apply it in your life, it will make you anti-fragile. So that means like the Coke bottle, when you are shaken and mistreated and, and uh, you go through turmoil, it will actually make you stronger and lift you to the next level. All right, so let's look at those two rules. You can go to the next slide. I created this slide to illustrate this to you uh, more carefully. Just skip next one. All right, so the, let's focus on the bottom one. So the bottom rule says that Public recognition, you must go for public recognition. What it's not often said is that that ends in limited reward. So Jesus says that there's a certain kind of characteristic or certain kind of people that always seek public recognition. Right? So he uses the, here he speaks to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They want to be seen by men. Those are the words used. They want to be recognized by men. So whatever they do, whatever these kind of people do, it's always to be seen by other people, to be praised by other people. It's extremely important for these people to build their lives upon what other people think of them, what other people say of them, to be recognized by other people, to get an applause from other people. And they will go through great lengths to do that. They will dress you know, it's, it's very important to dress, you know, to have the right labels on your, on your clothes. It's very important to have the right badge on your car. It's very important to have the right address. It's very important to have titles. It's very important to get recognition by men, to be seen by men. That's the emphasis. The funny thing is God says that the reason... Why you do that, or the reason why those people oftentimes do that, is to find worth inside. Public recognition to feel good inside. Right? So look, just look at the little picture on the bottom. We take in from the outside all the praises and the recognitions that we run after to feel good inside. Now look at the arrows. Is that unlimited or is it limited? It's extremely limited. It box you in. That's where it stops. It stops here. Okay, I feel good. So what? Now we go for the next fad. Now we make more debt. Now we do this to impress people more. And it all stops here just to feel good. So it's unlimited loss and limited gain. It just stops here. I feel good for a moment and that's where it stops. And that will make you fragile. I will tell you later why it will make you fragile. Jesus is highlighting this here. And then he says, he explains to us the flip side. He says, but there's another rule that you can apply in your life that will unlock something in you that, um, that will lift you to the next level. And that is, don't run for public recognition. Amen. Run for private recognition in my sight. That's what you need to run after. So he says here, go into your room, close the door, and your father who sees what's done in secret, he will reward you in public. So he says, when you give, don't even know, don't announce it, don't, don't even let the other person know that you're giving. Your father who sees what's done in secret, the top green box, that's where the recognition is. And that will open up unlimited gain because your father will reward you in public. It's that scripture that says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will raise you up. And when God raises you up, it cannot be taken away from you. Even if there's a shaking in the environment, it's like Mordecai in the book of Esther. When God puts you on a, on a place and God puts you in a position... Because he, he rewards you um, because of what you've done with a pure heart. There's unlimited gain. Now, I see this rule work in the life of Saul and in the life of David. So, uh, if you think of the life of Saul, Saul is the red box kind of guy, right? If you think of his life, 
What was important for him? Just the accolades and the praises of people. All right? You can remember if you read the life of Saul when uh, at a certain stage when David started to get victory with the armies and he went in with his entourage into the city, into Jerusalem, and the ladies started to sing. What did they sing? Can you remember? Saul killed his thousands, but David killed his ten thousands. Are you reading your Bible? It's in there. You should go and check it out. All right, so the women started to praise David more in public. And what did that do to Saul? It triggered jealousy in his heart. Why? Because it was so important for him to get recognition in public. Right? And then um, we see later on in his life, the first... Um, um, uh, big mistake as a king that he made is, um, you know, they needed to sacrifice before battle. Um, Samuel, the prophet, lingered a bit longer and um, he got irritated. Not irritated, he, got, he felt pressure uh, from his men. His men said, no, listen, Saul, we need, to, we need to go into battle. And he gave in because the opinions of men were so very important to him. So he gave in to the pressure and then he sacrificed. And then Samuel arrived later on, and then, um, and that was, that was his first uh, big s mistake as a king, and then a bit later on, um, they were again, you know, they had to go into battle, and the instruction from the Lord was very clear, you have, you have to, um, uh, what's the English word for bond, you have to, uh, oh, help me, don't I, you have to strike the enemy, uh, Okay, I can't get on to the English term now. But, but you know, sometimes God said when you, when you go into battle, you have to kill everything. You can't take any of the loot for yourself, right? You have to kill everything. Um, uh, everything is the Lord's. And because of the pressure of men, Saul did not adhere to that. So they took the best of the loot for themselves. And then Samuel arrived. Do you remember that story? And, um, and then when Samuel, Samuel arrived, he, arrived, he said, what bleating of sheep is in my ears? And he said, no, 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 we brought it to sacrifice to the Lord. And then Samuel said those well-known verses that the Lord is more interested in obedience than in sacrifice. And at that, on that day, Saul lost his kingdom. Why? Because he applied that rule. It was so important for him to get recognition in public. Very limited gain, and at the end, it made him so fragile that he lost his kingship. It, was, it wasn't God's heart. I believe God's heart was that he would have been a great king. But he chose differently. He chose to build a kind of characteristic and a substance in his life that applied that red rule. And that made him very fragile, and he lost, he lost his kingship. On the other hand, there was a, a young shepherd boy. And for him, the recognition was in the secret place. Uh, he was behind the sheep, alone, I can imagine, some evenings at his little fire, sitting there, worshipping God, alone, under the stars, with his harp. His heart was at the right place, in the secret place. He had a tenderness towards God. And in 1 Samuel 16, we read, where God rejected Saul as king, God told the prophet Samuel, go and anoint a new king. He sent him to the house of Jesse. And, um, and he had Jesse march all his sons in front of him. And then even Samuel, the big prophet, was misled by the outward. He said, surely, you know, when he started to see the, you know, how big and muscular and, and impressive these other sons of Jesse were. He said, surely, Lord, this is the one. The Lord said, no, it's not this one. Second one, this must be the one. No, it's not the one. Number three, no, it's not this one. Number four, oh Lord, this must be the one. He looks impressive. No, it's not this one, Samuel. Number five, not this one. Number six, no. Number seven, no. I remember then he said, well, haven't you got any other son? Yes, oh little David, he's there alone behind the sheep. And then Samuel said, fetch him because God chose him because not what men sees on the outside is what God is looking for. God is looking at the heart on the inside. Private recognition. When nobody can see that, God is looking at your heart. And that's the kind of substance that you need to, to run after. In Genesis 17, 
uh, God is talking to Abram, and he says, Abram, walk before my walk before me, and you will be blameless. That's a recipe. In that secret place where only God can see the motives of your heart, where only God can see why you do things what you do, where you run after the recognition that only God can give you, even if no man can see that, that's what you need to run after. Because that is what will put you in a place so that when the turmoil strikes, it will lift you to a higher place and you will go from glory to glory and from strength to strength. That is what God's heart is for each one of you. So why do we um, have to know this? Because um, that's how we have to position ourselves, but it speaks, it actually puts a finger on your motives and my motives. I want to ask you a couple of questions. And these questions are, how important is position to each one of you? How much energy do you spend and desire do you have in your life, a drive in your life to get a, a great position, to be recognized by men? Don't answer me. This is, you have to be honest to yourself. How much important is possessions to you? I mean, how, how much time do you spend on thinking how you can make enough money to buy a flashy car? Or one day you really want to, to, to live in a house with the right kind of a dress. How important is it to wear branded clothes? I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying what is the motive and the drive inside of your heart? How important is it for you to mingle and to be seen and to be known by important people? It gives you an indication where you seek your recognition. Or, on the other hand, how important is it for you, like Colossians 3 verse 23, to do what you do as if you are doing it unto the Lord, even if the eye of your boss is not on you? How important is that for you, that you will get the right tick and the accolades from God, even if no man can see that? I think those are questions that you and I need to ask ourselves honestly to determine which rule are currently working in, and is at play in our lives. And it's a very important question that you need to ask yourself, because that might determine how you, uh, what the result is going to be when uh, the rapids of life strike in your life and in my life. So, point number one is hidden recognition in the secret place when only God can see leads to unlimited and true reward. Number two is that uh, limitation or limitations in life, or limitations leads to life or equals life. Let, 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 I messed it up. Let me read it again. Limitation or limitations equals life, sometimes life in abundance. So I want to ask you to get your pen out or your cell phone. I'm going to show you a picture. I'm going to show you a photo. And I want to ask you to identify just very quickly the, the kind of emotion or immediate thoughts that come up when I show you this picture. Right? Are you ready? Okay, let me tell you what, I, what, what, what comes up. I, I know some of you get exhilarated when you see stuff like that. But, you know, I, I just think this is a bad idea. This is going to end in a bad place. You know, if that guy slips, he's going to tumble down there. You know, I don't want to be that kind of driver. You know, this, I get all nervous and tense when I just look at that picture. I just think this is a bad idea. What in the world was this guy thinking to go and drive there? So I want to show you a second picture, and, um, and again, I want, just want you to pinpoint and quickly jot down what is um, the kind of emotions this trigger. All right, exactly. <laughs> this guy said, lekker, ne? Exactly. I just feel when I look at that picture, wow, you know, yeah, let's go, you know, this is speed. 
and openness and enjoyment and, um, and, and freedom. But you know what the funny thing is? Um, in Matthew 7, you can turn with me. Matthew 7. Um, God, you know, works with a different set of rules. Matthew 7 verse 13. It says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. So what I have found, to be quite honest, in my own life. You can go to the next slide. And the next one. So, so God says, oh, this is life. It might be a contradiction in terms, but, but, but this road is going to end in life and life in abundance. And this road is going to end in destruction. Right? My natural man does not like that. Because on the left hand side, that narrow road feels to me narrow it feels restricted, it feels limited, it feels like I have to put in a lot of concentration and focus not to slip down there. It feels that I have to be very careful, and my goodness, it feels that it's going to take a long time. This is going to be slow. Now, that's oftentimes how we feel if we choose to walk accurately with God and with the Holy Spirit. We feel restricted. Our natural man feels restricted. We feel that, you know, do I have to pray again about this? Do I have to seek God's will again about this? You know, limited options. I mean, it, sometimes for my natural man, you know, these guys in the world, they can just do as they please. You know, they, they, there are no limitations. They, they just carry on. They are relaxed and, and they carry on. But God says, that's not the way to life. The way to life is precision. It's focus. It's dependence. It feels narrow for your flesh. It feels restricted. If that is the feeling that you have about the choices that you make, you're on the right path. Do you know that some of the biggest pushback we get in this congregation is because of the prophetic. And we're a congregation that takes the prophetic very seriously. Because we, we believe that there's a principle in the Bible of hear and obey. That's why Pastor Cornelius introduced the day word principle. It's not the new gospel, but it's a principle. We hear from God and we obey. That's why we bring in prophetic counseling because we take the voice of God seriously and then to be obedient to that but that is one of the things that oftentimes people don't like why is that because it feels restricted it feels too narrow for your flesh it feels that there's a discipline that squeezes you in a certain direction and you don't want that. You want to have the open road. I've got news for you. That's the way of the cross. The way of the cross is the, the day you gave your life over to God. You gave up your right to yourself. And Jesus said that I am doing nothing Unless I see my father do that. It's the narrow road. It feels slow. It feels restricted. It feels tense. But God says, that's the way, that's the road that you should choose. Because that's your preservation. That will make you anti-fragile. So that when the rapids of life hits, when there's turmoil, when there's mistreatment, you don't react to the outside impetus and the outside voices. 
you are trained to react to God's voice and to be disciplined to walk only according to his plan. Beautifully illustrated in, in the book of Acts. At a certain point, Paul is on one of his mission trips. I think it's on his second mission trip. And there's a woman uh, with, a, with, a, with a spirit of... Um, uh, um, help me. Uh, divination, thank you. A spirit of divination. So, so she's walking behind Paul and his, his group of people for days saying, these are the men of God. You know, they are here to, to show you the, the way to eternal life, to, to preach to you um, uh, the, the way to eternal life for days. And I always thought, you know, why didn't Paul just turn around and cast out the demon? I mean, he's the great apostle Paul. I believe the reason why he waited, I think it was three days. He waited until God gave him that release in his spirit to do that. Absolute discipline. Not moved by what the devil wants him to do. Right? Under the complete control of the Holy Spirit. And then he turned around after three days. And he cast out the demon. I'm asking you, at what level of accuracy are you functioning? And so, I'm not going to um, go into all the scriptures. For those of you who take notes, you can also jot down Matthew 13. Same principle, Matthew 13, verse 31 to 33. It's the principle also of the mustard seed and the leaven. Um, and the principle is simply, just like the narrow road, it's the small and insignificant stuff under God's guidance that has got the great power to change everything. That's where the power lies. Mustard seed, the smallest of all the seeds, and the leaven, insignificant. You can't even see that, but it changes the whole dough. The same principle applies. And then in Matthew 5, verse 29 to 30, I'm going to read it. Matthew 5, verse 29 to 30. Um, so let me read from verse 28. But I tell you that anyone who looks at the woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, couch it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if you, your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. What are we talking about here? I believe the principle is Jesus says that leave the wide road, cut off the excess stuff, Make it less because your answer and your breakthrough is in the little, in the small, in the narrow. Now to make it very practical, so a, a, a other example is also where Jesus said that, you know, his, his, his disciples asked, you know, how can a rich man enter the kingdom of heaven? Because he said that it's only the, the um, you know, a camel can go through the eye of a needle. Right, and the, and the metaphor, or the illustration is that in those big, big gates, the city gates in the olden times, they had a small gate that you could open up and you can go through. And that small gate was just large enough for a camel to go through. But the camel could not go through with baggage on his back. You had to take everything off the camel, and then they could, the camel could go through that small little door in the big gate. And that small little door was called the eye of the needle. And God said, if you want to enter into his, his zone of full authority, his kingdom, you need to get rid of stuff with the basic essentials of what God wants. And then you can enter through the eye of the needle. That's your answer. So the point here with cutting off and gouging out the eye is re to return to the, to the small road. Which means that your answer, my friend, might often lie in less and not more. It's important, I'm going to say it again. The answer to your big question in your heart right now might often lie in less, not in more. Give me, let me give you, I jotted down a couple of things. 
If you sit in financial trouble right now, or financial turmoil, your natural inclination would be, I need to get more money, right? That's logic. But your answer might be that you don't need more money. You need to start to give away money, less money. That might be your breakthrough. So I believe that's where the principle of tithes come in because it just releases us from the grip of mammon. And, and maybe you sit here and say, well, I don't have anything to give, but you've got time to give. You've got skills to give. You've got abilities to give. Start to sow. That might be your answer to your financial breakthrough. Not more, less. Start to give your time and your abilities to other people. That might be the key to your financial breakthrough. And there are many examples and testimonies in that. Maybe you sit here with depression. Maybe your answer is not, not more stuff that will ma try making you happy. Maybe your, your, your answer is start to give away to make other people happy. Start to focus on what makes other people happy. That might just be your key to your emotional breakthrough. Maybe you're in your prayer life. Maybe you've been praying for many, many years for something uh, in your own life or in your own immediate situation, immediate family for a breakthrough. Maybe your answer is to stop praying for yourself and to start praying for other people. Amen. And maybe young men, young man, you sit here and you struggle with pornography. And maybe your answer is not more other stuff more solutions. Maybe the answer is simply just give your cell phone away. Get yourself one of those old phones with the knoppies, with the buttons. Or maybe cut off your internet or your data. Maybe it's as simple as that. Not more, less. Give it away. Cut it off. Throw it away. Maybe the answer is as simple as that. Oftentimes I'm shocked by the power of the gospel is locked up in the, the simplicity, but we miss it because we want to listen to so many other voices. So limitation or limitations in God's economy oftentimes lead to life and life in abundance. And if we understand that, then we save ourselves from this to get broken by circumstances and by the systems of the world. And to put ourselves in a place that when turmoil and mistreatment strikes, we can excel and we can move from glory to glory. Amen. May God help us. May God help each one of us. The last principle is protect your freedom of choice to give. Protect your freedom of choice to give. Let's turn to Matthew 5 verse 38. Matthew 5, verse 38. It says, You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn him the other also. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one kilometer, go with him two kilometers. Give. To the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. I struggled for, for some time with, with this portion of scripture because it sort of gave for me the impression that God wants us to be um, mistreated and that we should just allow abuse in our lives and mistreatment and so on. I, I thought it was Sort of, an, And I struggled with the idea, how could God ask me to do that, right? To, to, to allow abuse in my life or to allow and, and to counsel other people to allow abuse in their lives. And then I realized this is not what this portion of scripture actually says. It actually speaks to the ability that you and I have to make a choice. In also in extreme circumstances like this, to make a choice to be generous and to give. 
Let me put it differently. Inside each one of us, we carry the ability, the freedom inside of us to choose. Right? It's your choice whether you're going to activate that freedom to, make, to choose to make a choice in any given circumstance or just to, to surrender to say, I don't have a choice. And that makes the world's difference. So let me explain it to you in light of, of the scripture. So in those days, um, if you were a Roman citizen, you had the right to tell a non-Roman citizen to carry your bags for one kilometer. You could do that by law. You could do that. So I could say to Pastor Emil, I, um, I don't want, it's a hot day. I don't want to carry my bag. It's heavy. And so you are not a Roman citizen. I am. So you have to carry my bag for one kilometer. He has to do that. He doesn't have a choice. By law, he has to do that. So what Jesus says is that do that because you don't have a choice, but at the end of that kilometer, activate your freedom to make a choice and give another kilometer. Because that will free you. And the same with the other examples they gave you. So what Jesus actually says is that no system can suppress you. If you continuously activate inside of you your freedom, your choice to give, to be generous. Because you understand that you are a son. You're a king of the most high. You sit with him in heavenly places. You've got an inheritance with the king of kings. Doesn't matter if you're suppressed by a system. That's your position in heaven. Because you sit there and because the king of kings is your father, you're not an orphan. You are generous even to somebody that, that oppresses you. I once heard, um, I can't remember who it was, um, somebody that counseled um, as somebody that was, uh, a, a other couple that was for years in sort of a position in society of oppression. And, um, and he, 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 he illustrated to them to say that, listen, up to now, you are bound by the system because you only do what the system tells you to do. Right? That, that's the definition of slavery. The, the, the system puts you in a disadvantaged position and you have to do certain things and, and, and you feel oppressed because you, you, you are dictated by the system. The way to get free from this is to activate your freedom to choose. So go beyond that. If the system requires you to do this, go beyond that. Activate your freedom to give. And sometimes it's just in that moment to make the decision to do what you do with the right kind of attitude and not with murmuring. That's also activating your freedom to give because you turn it into a praise song to God, even if it's required of you. So a lot of examples that we can, that we can think of. Um, I think one of, one of the great examples in Scripture is Paul and Silas. In, uh, when, I, I believe it was in Philippi. You know, they were preaching, they got caught, um, you know, they got um, uh, martyred for that. And they were there uh, in chains, in prison, late at night. Probably their bodies were aching, they were mistreated. It was unfair, do you agree with me? And what did they do? Did they murmur and feel sorry for themselves? They activated their freedom of choice to give. And they gave praise to God. And that's when God intervened. And he turned the situation around. You and I have got that same choice. I see the same principle apply in a fellow named Richard Wurmbrandt. And, um, and so before I read his quote to you, let me just explain to you who this fellow was. Richard Wurmbrandt was a Jew that got converted to Christianity um, in the time when Romania was under communist rule. And because of his faith in Jesus Christ, Christ um, the, the communists uh, um, uh, uh, imprisoned him and they tortured him quite severely. And uh, he was for 14 years in prison. 
And at a certain stage for three of those 14 years, they put him in a cell 12 feet underground. He didn't see uh, one, one brink of sunshine during that time for three years. And he made the choice to give. You know what he did every day in that cell? He worked out a sermon. And he gave a sermon to himself, by himself, every day in that cell. And in that cell, they started to develop Morse code with the fellow people in the cells next to him. And they started to share the hope and the light of Jesus Christ. Twelve feet underground for three years. He activated his choice to be generous and to give because he understood his position as a son at the table of the King of Kings in heaven. So he said, and listen carefully, he said, a communist officer told a Christian he was beating, I'm almighty as you suppose your God can be, I can kill you. The Christian answered, the power is all on my side, I can love you while you torture me to death. Victor Frankl uh, he was also a Jew in the, um, in the Second World War, the horrific time where um, the Nazis killed um, millions of Jews in the gas chambers. He said, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. So I'm asking you, or you may be sitting in a situation where you experience that you are mistreated, abused, belittled, unfairly treated, suppressed. Maybe this is the time when you need to activate your choice, your freedom to give forgiveness to those people who are doing wrong against you. Forgiveness is a gift that you give to somebody. It's a choice that you make. Maybe you should activate your freedom to pray for those people, to bless those people, to meet their needs. Maybe it's a time when you need to choose to give praise and worship to God, even if the circumstances scream the opposite to you. And maybe... You are just doing the bare minimum in your current situation, maybe at work or at home. And maybe God is asking you to go the extra mile, to activate your choice, to give, to be generous to those oppressors and those people around you. Because if you do this, you build certain characteristics into your life that will move you from this where the system can break you to a place we can really soar like an eagle and excel uh, and move from glory to glory. So we've spoken about three principles. There are many, many more, but just those three principles in order to, to make yourself what, what is called anti-fragile, the opposite of being fragile, like that eagle that soars, to prepare you optimally for the future so that God, you can move into that place that God wants. Hidden recognition in that secret place where only God can see equals unlimited reward. That's where the true reward will lie. Number two, limitation, the narrow path that feels ah, for your flesh leads to life and abundance. And my brother and my sister, protect your freedom of choice under all circumstances to be generous to give. Father, thank you that... Your word says that the thoughts that you have towards each one of us are thoughts to give us a hope and a future. And so first of all, Father, we want to confess and want to ask, Lord, forgive us for every time we thought that you were wrong. We thought that, that we were dealt a bad hand, that that. Other people can be happy, with, but we can't. That, that you haven't got a great life for us and a great future for us in store. Those thoughts were wrong and not aligned with your word. And we confess it as sin this, this afternoon. We pray that you will forgive us for that. That's not the truth. 
Father, we choose to believe the truth. And the truth is that you've got great plans for each one of us. Lord, your heart is that each one of us will soar like an eagle, that we will move from glory to glory, from strength to strength, irrespective of the circumstances we find ourselves in. Father, I pray for each person in front of me that through your spirit that you will grant them the ability to build into their lives, like wise virgins, the kind of qualities, the kind of nature that will put them in a position where you can take them to the heights and the plans and the dreams that you've got for each one of them. Lord, I want to pray for every person that might have been broken by circumstances, by a system, by mistreatment, by turmoil in the past, where they, in some aspects of their lives they might feel that they, their lives are, sh are shattered, whether by their own choices or the choices of others. It doesn't matter, but Father, I pray that you will come in this moment and touch those people, touch their hearts, touch their lives. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will come and mend, that you will come and heal, that you will come and touch right now in this moment. Come and pour out your healing power over every life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that through your blood, today can be a new day. It can be a new beginning. It can be a fresh start for each one of us. And we just thank you for that. In the wonderful, wonderful name of Jesus Christ and that name alone. Amen.